Okay, so today, as promised, uh, I'm going to walk through a bunch of examples of assignment twos, some of which I found online that meet the uh, actual criteria, some of which are student work. Um, you've probably already looked through some of the student work, so you've probably already seen uh, a lot of the ones that I'll show you. But hopefully I'll talk about some of the strategies that people used and kind of how they got to where they, uh, how they achieved what they needed to uh, in terms of blending the images together and that sort of thing. Um, and then we'll move into, today we're going to isolate objects uh, and build a bunch of uh, basically silhouettes of people, cutouts, that sort of thing. Uh, the idea being that you're going to learn how to get rid of backgrounds, mask things off, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, especially with the finer details of like hair and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll talk through what all that means and, and how you go about it. But first we're going to go through some of the uh, Photoshop examples. Uh, some of them are remarkably creepy. <coughs> Uh, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with creepy, but um, a lot of times it's about trying to um, come up with a thematic idea. Uh, so in this one, we've got Jekyll and Hyde, the two sides uh, of the same person. Um, so this is two separate images that were shot. Uh, key point, all the lighting conditions are always the same. And so if you're going to combine two images that are different, the, the biggest thing that you can do is make sure that the light sources are the same. Uh, their lights coming from the same direction, uh, they're about the same brightness, and that sort of thing. So in this context, it's shot with flash, uh, black background, consistent, uh, one image and the next image. Those two then combine along this scene. So you might take the eye from this side, right, and or half of the eye from that side, and as you blend it together, right, notice that that seam is conveniently covered by hair, which always helps. Um, when you blend it together, you're working in this region with masking such that you can create one side and the other side. Does that kind of make sense? Right? You're just putting them side by side. So it's really not that hard to do. Uh, the key is in the original image and how it's put together. Uh, this was one that's not as well done because you can tell the, the distinct separate uh, nature of it, and the shadows are backwards. Right? So the shadow on the tree is on this side, the shadow on the toes is on that side. Right? So the, it should be flipped. Uh, as an example. These ones tend to be very easy to do. Um, it's, it's a very simple, you know, one person looking into a mirror, looking into a frame, that kind of thing. The reflection is different. Uh, this is a very simple mask. You just have to take two photos, one of you looking into the mirror, and another one with somebody else standing here, right, looking into the mirror, getting their reflection. You capture the reflection, you mask off the mirror, let one photo show through the mirror. Does that make sense? It's a relatively simple one to do. Right? Creepy. Don't know how much more I can say about it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an image of a face overlaid with the image of a hand. Obviously, they're over-processed, um, and that's the nature of them. There's a whole series of these that I'll show you um, where they're taking you know, pieces and, and filling them in. Um, this one's bizarre as well, uh, but again, very doable. At this time, they're playing with the sizes. You know, you've got one hand that's, that's shrinking down to be the ends of there. I think this one's actually really well done, um, partly because of its subtlety, um, but some of the key things that they're doing is when you're combining the pair of shoes with the toes at the end, the wrinkles in the leather, they tried really hard to make sure the wrinkles match the wrinkles in the toes, uh, and that's part of what leads to this believability, uh, that it could be there. And I think one of the great things about doing this and photoshopping something is you can make the impossible possible. Um, and so, another example, um, kind of abstracted. I think this one's really well done. Uh, I've seen students try to do this um, in practice. One of the keys to this is getting the really good picture of the leaf with the right lighting and then matching the face lighting to it because it's hard for you to lay down right where the leaf is and take the picture of yourself. Does that make sense? So you may need uh, somebody to help you take this picture if you're going to be in it. All right, get your friend to take the picture and then reciprocate. Um, <clears throat> playing with the depth of field, right? This one's not too hard to do in terms of, uh, obviously you have to cut out the eye shape. You have to design what that shape is going to be. Uh, background, right? You're taking the blurred image from the background, superimposing something that's black in the same shape and cutting it out. So it's not too bad to do. Uh, could be done with something as simple as, you know, you could take a white puzzle piece, right? Use that, hold that, superimpose your eye on that, um, and create it that way. Sometimes you create things uh, with drawings uh, over, over different layers. 
This was one I did uh, when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley. Actually, won an uh, art competition out of it. Um, but in this particular example, uh, you know, it's the picture of the knife with a Photoshop filter that created the the outline, the drawing. Uh, this was a printed photo uh, that I was holding, um, and I made sure that the scar line in the tree ran through my finger and then ultimately ran into being a drawing here. So it was a combination of different mediums to try to you know, obviously win the art competition. Um, sometimes you can get into the kind of the creative things. And this is where you just have to see things. Anybody ever looked at the carrots and seen a bunch of eyes looking at you? You know, you can play around with that sort of thing. Sometimes it's in the subtlety of the repetition of we got all the ends of the carrots and then wait, there's one that doesn't match. Okay. Uh, and so you can play around with that a little bit. Uh, this, was, this was part of a class uh, that I did. Uh, the whole idea behind this uh, came from a class that I took at Berkeley that was a, a visual studies class uh, where we had this really goofy professor who was fantastic and he would give us a handwritten assignment. He didn't type anything. He would write out these assignments by hand. Um, and he would, uh, it was a photography class, and he would assign us to photograph things that were completely impossible to photograph. And so you had to figure out how, how to photograph whatever. This one was how to photograph the mind. Um, he gave us one that was how to photograph Mother Nature. He gave us a bunch of different ones that were it, really hard to figure out, you know, because you can't go out and photograph Mother Nature. You can't photograph the mind. Um, and it was, it was kind of fun. I love this one. Um, it's it, not too hard. Again, lighting conditions are key to making it work, right? Shadow is on this side. Shadow should be on this side of the hand, which it is. That's why it works. So you pay a lot of attention to those lighting conditions. Um, and you can get pretty creative about what, what kinds of things come together. Uh, another example, combining the texture of a you know, ground uh, with an eye. I, I like this one. <laughs> um, so it's, again, relatively simple, right? You have to take one picture uh, with your, your feet and your pants down, and then you have to take another picture with just the pants without your feet in them, and then you combine the two. Um, so not that hard to do, but you get really interesting results out of it. Um, that one, this one works. It's not my favorite, but it works really nicely because of the shape of the leaf naturally dips right where the person is sitting, and it works because this is so well integrated into the background photo. So a lot of times in this, when you're trying to pick your two photos, you'll take a hundred photos of the leaf to get the exact right angle so it'll match the other picture. Uh, and that's one of the things that can take some time. Um, this is like the, uh, when you see something in a cloud or you see something in a rock formation, how do you combine the two together uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, this one was kind of interesting. I don't know how he came up with this idea. This is student work. Uh, the, the last several have been student work. Don't know how he came up with the idea of combining these together. Um, I, the only thing I was not that happy about was that this was not his image. Uh, the apple was his image, but this one wasn't. Um, so he got a little bit, uh, it looks better because he obviously borrowed a professional's image to do it. But the concept is still uh, pretty good. Um, I don't know any, whether any of you have met Arash. Uh, he's around sometimes. I think he works on Saturdays this semester. Uh, this was back when he was in the class, probably four or five years ago. Uh, he does not have all of those tattoos. Um, nor was he ever put in jail, <laughs> uh, but he created all of this in Photoshop. So it was a matter of his, uh, his portrait, uh, and then he went through and found the tattoos and that sort of thing, or took pictures of those tattoos, and then superimposed them on himself. Um, and of course, the zipper at the lips and that sort of thing, right? This one was just kind of bizarre, but it was kind of interesting at the same time. Um, this one's weird. Uh, I think it would work a lot better. It's very subtle, uh, and you don't see it so much. It would work better if the background wasn't so stark. If it was a little bit more subdued background, uh, it, would, it would read a little bit better. Um, this one, just plain creepy. <laughs> um, but it's the combination of the cat and the person. Uh, same concept. Again, lighting conditions are, are really the big factor. So this was another one that students did, uh, that a student did. And this is probably one of the worst photographs that you could possibly work from. I mean, this is like a cell phone, you know, frontal flash snapshot, but it's a perfect illustration of how lighting conditions make this work. So he took the picture of the pigs in exactly that manner, you know, point and shoot with the flash, but at the same time, he went home and took a picture of the dog in the exact same way. So when they combine together, they work completely seamlessly. Uh, and that's kind of one of the critical things about this. Uh, so I like to use that as an example. 
Sometimes they become a little bit more artistic than not. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. This was a lot of superimposed images that are working together um, to, to kind of create this self-portrait. Uh, this one is relatively subtle. It's just swapping out the skirt for the bottom of a flower, um, but it, it works nicely. Uh, this one, I, I really, I've always really liked this one uh, because it's a combination of the hand drawing. I think he did a really good job of adding color in parts of the image, turning parts of the image black and white, and kind of how that blend happens. Uh, works nicely. You guys saw this one on your handout. Um, this was a, a, a really good one uh, in terms of how it comes together, uh, probably from three or four years ago. Um, and so it's a pretty simple shot. She set it up with her against the wall, uh, replaced herself with just the hanger, and then it's a matter of seaming, uh, you know, this part of the shirt, you, you get rid of yourself and seam in the, uh, the, the shirt when it's hanging flat against the wall. So again, not that hard, uh, but certainly uh, entertaining. Uh, Bekem did this one, uh, which I also thought was good. Uh, some of the key things that uh, she did in this, um, this is as simple as she sat on a stool. So she was sitting on a stool. Uh, she took one shot of her sitting on the stool and another shot with nothing there. Uh, and so when you put the two together, um, it, it's helpful if you shot something like this with a tripod. So you're exactly in the same position when you, when you combine them together. And so what she did is she put the image of her with the, the uh, stool on top, and she just did a mask on that image, letting the background, which was the same shot but without her in it, come through. And so she was able to, to cut out where the stool was, but she also paid a lot of attention to where the stool uh, shadow would have shown up. And part of the reason this image is as successful as it is is because the shadow makes her float, right? And the shadow is perfect. And so that's something that's really uh, important to, to figure out. Uh, this was obviously shot just outside here. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't have to be in a special place, uh, but it's a good example. Uh, this is the, oh my God, I woke up in the morning and I have no legs, right? It's just kind of entertaining, uh, but it's the same concept, right? Where you're taking one image of the pants by themselves, one image with you in them, and you're superimposing the two and blending them together. Yeah. Uh, bizarre too, but kind of entertaining at the same, uh, at the same time. It's exactly the same concept, two images uh, and putting them together. Okay, so those are just some examples. Uh, hopefully it helped for me to talk through how they were created a little bit. Um, at least that was the idea. Okay, so for exercise 109, um, we're going to build collage elements. Uh, and by collage elements, I basically mean we're going to cut out people uh, and or objects or landscape objects. Um, and we're going to make them have a transparent background such that you could use them in a uh, architectural image like, say, this one. Uh, and so in this example, this person right, was cut out uh, and then superimposed over the blurry background. Uh, and so if we cut these people out in advance, you can go pick from a big library of people that have been cut out and you don't have to do that work along the way. Uh, one of the best things I did in grad school is when I first started grad school, I spent some time and just cut out a bunch of people. And it takes an investment of time to do that. But then when you're trying to do your architectural drawings, it becomes really easy to drop people in when you need them. And it's amazing how much more realistic your architectural drawings become if you put people in. Uh, and so having these people cut out made it really easy to put people in, therefore you do it. Um, you probably noticed in studio, you built a model or something like that, and whoever came in to critique said, man, it'd be really helpful if you had some more people in here to, to show what the space is like and what the scale is like. People are really critical to understanding what architecture is and how it works. So a lot of times we, we want these people cut out. So good news for you. Uh, you're going to cut out some people today. I'm going to ask you to do five things, five people, maybe four people and a tree, whatever. It's kind of up to you uh, in terms of what you want to do. Um, I think in the, the handout, I actually say that I want you to do 10. I'm going to make you do five. Um, if you finish the five and want to keep going, by all means, keep going. Uh, but this, is, this exercise has been going on for a long time, which means that there's a bunch of things that people have already done, uh, and you'll have access to them. So if you go to resources and then collage images on the course website, you can see that there are people, there are animals, there are objects, there are landscape objects, there are buildings, uh, and all of these you can use. Uh, some are in black and white, some are in color. Um, you're going to be creating both today. Uh, so if I were to click on one, for example, there's a person in color, right? If we scroll down, we can see a gray silhouette version, a black and white version, and a color version. 
The nice thing about these is it's as simple as clicking on them uh, and then right clicking and saying save. Oops, let me close this. Let me do it from here. Uh, save image as. Right? If you save it, it comes in as a PNG uh, and you can then use that image in one of your uh, projects down the road. So, um, let me jump backwards here. If we, they're, they're also divided up. So if you want to see more people, you can click on more people. It will s separate them by females and males. There's also peoples by action or people, peoples, good job. Uh, people by images uh, or index. Um, if you go into the females, it will order these lists by popularity, which ones have been used most. Uh, show them first uh, and then go backwards. There are tons and tons and tons and tons of these. Um, and so you can spend some time actually scrolling through and finding ones that, that work for you uh, as we go backwards in time. Anyway, so when I'm going about creating or getting some of these objects, uh, I need to f use one's photos that I've taken uh, or I need to find some. And uh, when, when you go to find some, I'm gonna suggest that you, you come up to the top here, go to the Creative Commons search which is search.creativecommons.org. Uh, basically, if you search from here, uh, this will give you the ability uh, to use the image. Uh, and so people have licensed this for you to use it. Um, therefore, it's not, you're not stealing it from anybody, is the idea. Uh, you are supposed to link back to the original image. So ideally, you make a note of what the image is and link back to it um, as, as an original image. So uh, I'm going to make sure Flickr is checked here, which it is. It's kind of uh, hard to see on the screen, but it does have a little uh, click on it. And then you're going to type in something, uh, some type of person that you're trying to look for. So, you know, it could be, uh, you know, woman sitting or something, okay? It used to be really easy. You used to be able to put in, uh, you know, person walking, and you get a bunch of people walking. If you put in person walking or people walking now, you'll get a bunch of people dressed up like zombies because of the walking dead. So it's a little bit more challenging to find good images, um, but spend some time scrolling through uh, and you'll be able to find them. Some of the key things uh, when you're looking for images um, in terms of finding the right ones, you, uh, you want to make sure that the whole person is included. Um, and so you, what you don't want is to have part of the person chopped off. The other thing is you don't want some odd perspective. Uh, so you, don't, you, you would like something where it's relatively straight on. Uh, something like this would work nicely uh, as a cutout uh, where something like right that one's bad because somebody got cut off this one's probably not ideal because you're looking down at the person uh, which would be less usable in an architectural context uh, it's rare to have a perspective looking down at a corner like this uh, so you this one would be great uh, in terms of finding it. So let's open it in a new tab. Usually what I do is I start to open these images in new tabs so that I can look through uh, and pick which one I want to work with. Uh, and so I've already picked a bunch of these um, that, I've, that I've looked looked for. I'm going to do this one as one of them. Uh, this one's relatively easy. There's another one. So I've just gone through and I've picked a variety of, of images that I can work with. I'm going to do this running one because of this hair and I want to illustrate how you would cut that part out. Uh, so I am going to use that one. So on these kinds of uh, images, when they're there, um, there should be a little button uh, in the lower right corner that says download, uh, download this photo. If it's not there, it's because you haven't searched where somebody allowed you to download it. They, they haven't licensed it for that. So if you can, you know, you'll be able to click on it and it'll say what size. Always pick the original size or the largest size you can. Uh, and we'll go ahead and let that start to download. Let me see this one wasn't bad so we'll download this one and let me see that one that one's a good one too again hair is always good um, it took me a while this morning to find these this one's not bad I'm gonna use this one because it's simple with no hair to illustrate one uh, strategy here so let me go ahead and download the original on that one okay and let me before I um, get too far I'm gonna show these in the folder um, so that I can uh, select them I'm going to hold down shift and select those three images and then I'll right click and say copy and I want to put them on my flash drive. So put them on my flash drive in 135 and this is new folder exercise 109. And I'm going to paste them in there so that we can work with them. Okay, so there's those images. 
Uh, again, largest that I could get them, uh, and, th and that's important. So now it's a matter of jumping into Photoshop, and we're going to start working through some of our techniques. So I'm going to go to Start. I'm going to make sure that I'm using CS6. So a de Design Standard CS6, and I'm going to open Photoshop CS6, and we'll let that open up. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and go to File, and then Open. And let me jump to my flash drive. And I'm going to open all three right now, because I don't know which, which one's which. Go ahead. go ahead and open them. Okay, so here's the first one. Uh, this is the one that I wanted to work with. So today, we're going to go through a variety of tutorials um, that kind of walk you through how to isolate um, these objects. The tutorials are under Photoshop, and we're going to go through starting with 1.13 through 1.16. Now, 1.13, I will. We're actually going to skip that one because CS6 cut that uh, ability out, um, and so you're no longer able to do it. So I have to delete that tutorial altogether. It only applies in older versions of Photoshop. Um, so we'll start with 1.14, which is the background eraser. So I'm going to jump back over into Photoshop. Uh, and so the background eraser works particularly well when you ha have one colored object and a very different color background. Uh, it makes life really easy to erase. If we get down here to the bottom where his feet are against this dark blue background and his pants are black, it's not going to work as well. Uh, and so we'll talk about how do you fix that. So before I get too far along, this image has a bunch of extra information in it that I really don't, don't want. Uh, so I'm going to use what's called the crop tool, uh, which is right here. It looks like kind of an overlapping set of uh, angles. And I'll click that, and you'll see that I'll get a dotted line around my image with a few little handles on each side. Uh, and I can drag these to make the image smaller. So I'm going to drag this over here. Notice principles of composition show up automatically when I'm going to crop. I've got the rule of thirds. Uh, but in this instance, I just want to isolate the person. Uh, and so... I'll drag these so that it's just around the person. Like that. And when I'm done, I'll hit this little check mark up here at the top ribbon, or, or I'll hit enter on the keyboard, and I end up with a nice uh, cropped version of this particular uh, person. Now, if I press Control-0 on the keyboard, it will fill the available screen real estate uh, with my selection. And so as I'm looking at this, this is not the best image because it's rather jagged, uh, but it'll get us through the background eraser um, as, a, as a technique. Uh, so the background eraser is, is shown against what's, what's this, this tool is an eraser. If I click and hold, there are actually three erasers in Photoshop. There's a magic eraser tool, there's a background eraser tool, and there's a regular erase tool. The regular erase tool works just like an eraser in terms of whatever you touch disappears. The background eraser uh, works to select colors of the background and erase those and not select colors of the foreground, uh, hopefully. Uh, and there's a way to select it. And the magic eraser is to try to discern what you want to erase and only erase that part of it. Um, these magic op options that are in Photoshop are getting better and better. Uh, and they're working better and better. So you can play around with that a little bit, uh, but we're going to talk through the background eraser tool, um, which is what I'm going to select. The icon for that is an eraser with a little pair of scissors on it. Okay. The other thing that happens in these um, Photoshop images is that uh, when we bring in the original image, or when we open the original image, it shows up on a layer called background, and it has a little lock on it. And what happens on that is I can't actually do any erasing on that layer. Uh, because it's on the background and because it's locked. So I need to make it an active, workable layer. And I'll do that by right-clicking on the layer and saying Layer from Background. And it'll switch from being background layer with a lock to being Layer 0, which is exactly what I want. Um, so now I have Layer 0. So the way the Background Eraser tool works uh, is it allows you to select a sampling color, uh, and it will look to erase that sample color and not erase the other colors in the image. And so in this instance, erasing right here is going to be relatively simple because I have a blue background and a dark black shirt. And so to, to select the sample color, I'll hold down the Alt key, and you'll see that my cursor changes to a little eyedropper um, tool, and I'll click. 
and that will then sample the color, and the color shows up right here. Okay? Then it's just a matter of when I go to erase, you can see that, lo and behold, it's erasing that particular color. But as I get close to my person, right, it's only erasing that blue color, not the dark black. Okay? That was a mistake, which happens. Uh, so let's go in here. Usually I like to do them in kind of small segments. Uh, if I need to resample the color, I'll hold down Alt and resample again. There we go. Did pretty well. Hold down Alt and sample there. And we'll erase against that. And I'll scroll down here. Again, I'll sample there. Oops. So it's not a perfect technique. Um, I do have to kind of go around my object something like that. And you do make those mistakes, so just be patient when you're doing it. Oops. So up here, I also have something called a tolerance of 50. If I, it's right in the middle. If I change this tolerance down, it's going to erase less uh, and be more precise about what colors it's going to erase, but you'll also end up with more of the background still showing through. So let's say I drop this down to 22 right now, and I do Alt, and I start to erase. Okay, it's doing a better job at that edge, but if I were to look in here, now it's kind of hard to see. There may be some pixels that are left over. Um, this is not the best quality image, um, so I don't know that you're going to be able to see it. But let me keep going minus. There we go. Uh, and so I'll continue on my way. Let's erase this. Now, there may come a point where you've got a bunch of information in the background here. Um, you can switch from the background eraser to the regular eraser uh, and just get rid of uh, extra information in the background. So, for example, I can do this, etc. Okay. So it's doing a pretty good job along that edge so far. Let me continue with that background eraser. And now I'm going to get here. And this is where it's going to get more complicated. And so let me go ahead and go to background eraser. And when I try to sample this color, and then I try to erase, see how it, it erases the shoe too? right? In this context, the background eraser is not that good because there's not a high contrast between one and the other. Uh, it would, however, work nicely over here against the white shoe. Right? So you just have to be intelligent about where you're using it. When I get to this part of the shoe, I'm going to switch to a regular eraser uh, and just go right along the edge there like that, just being careful. Now in this region right here, and I apologize that it's going to get pixelated, uh, it's just the original image, I have a little bit that I need to get rid of right in the center here. Uh, so I'm going to shrink my brush down by pressing the bracket key to make it a little bit smaller and then I'll come in and erase that piece as well. We've also got a little piece that's right in here. We'll get rid of that. Right, let me press Control minus so we can zoom out. And we can see it looks like there's still a little bit that could get shaved off. Like that. And let's go around the tip of the shoe like this. So similar issue here at the bottom. Right, let's go ahead and make my uh, brush a little bit bigger where I'm going to just have to do some of this by hand. And I wish there was a way around that, but given what the background is, there's no, there's no real simple solution. Um, so we'll continue across there, continue across here. OK, so once again, let me zoom in. And I'm going to manually get rid of this piece. that. Now, I've got that little tiny piece. Make my brush a little bit smaller, and we'll notch that piece out. Like that. Uh, now I can go back to the background eraser here, and once again, I can sample holding down Alt, that, uh, and that will erase nicely in there, because once again, I'm back to my normal color. We can go easily and erase this section. Oops, a little too much there. Okay, let me zoom in. Shit. Let me go to my regular eraser. Erase the bottom of the shoe. Right. 
that. Okay, we're getting there. Got a background eraser. Example. Uh, incidentally, I can hold down the space bar and pan my drawing as I'm working along it. So let's continue up here. Almost there. Okay, so I've got them relatively isolated. There's a few places that I need to touch up, so we'll go back to the regular eraser tool and we'll touch that part up there. Uh, let me go ahead and make my brush a little bit bigger just so that this is faster. I'll erase the rest of this background here. That little piece there. And this little piece here. And so what I end up with, right, if I press Control Zero, is I end up, oh, looks like I made a little mistake there. Uh, I end up with uh, the person that's been cut out uh, with no background. Uh, sometimes it's useful to see what the background actually would look like on white and see if you can see any artifacts or something that hasn't been deleted correctly, uh, in which case I can put a new layer below layer zero and I can fill that new layer with white. And I'm going to use the paint bucket tool, which is underneath the gradient tool, and I'm going to use white as my foreground color and just paint the background. And what this does is it lets us see if there are any artifacts or anything that, that I should have deleted. It uh, looks like there's a little bit of a problem right up in here. I don't even know if you can see it on the screen, uh, but I can correct that pretty quickly with a regular eraser. Oops. I have to be on layer zero. Let me correct that. It's a faint little problem right in there. Okay, so once that's done, let me press Control Zero, and I have this person ready. I'll turn off the background layer. I need this checkerboard behind, and I'm going to use File, Save for Web, but I'm going to pick something different. Typically, we've been picking JPEG. In this case, I'm going to pick what's called a PNG24. The reason I'm picking PNG24 is because of this checkbox right below, which says Transparency. And that will allow me to save my image with a transparent background. So it'll be cut out, which is exactly what I want. So it does say transparency. I'll go ahead and click save. And I'm going to save it uh, as something with a name that's, that's as descriptive as I can be. Oops. Uh, and so instead of that long string, we'll say that this is... Uh, I don't know, man walking, two underscores walking, um, I have no idea, call it man walking, <laughs> can't think of anything more descriptive, uh, with a hoodie, how about that, with hoodie, is that how you spell it, whatever, okay, so we'll say okay, and I've got that, so this is in color, I'd like there to be a black and white version of this, so I'm going to make this a black and white. So I'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Channel Mixer, which you've already done before. I'll check the box for monochrome. And remember, we can pick from one of the presets if there's one that looks better than another. We'll kind of go through them. You know, generally, one that's darker tends to be a little bit better. So that'll work. And I'll go to File, Save for Web. Uh, again, it's PNG24. When I click save, I'll use the same name, but I will add an underscore BW for black and white, and I'll go ahead and click save. Okay, so the other thing that can be very useful is to have one of these that is completely just kind of a neutral gray. So it's a silhouette, doesn't have any uh, actual person in it. Uh, and so I'm going to just really quickly create a selection. Uh, which is relatively easy to do uh, because I already have it cut out. Um, and I can use the magic wand tool, which is right here underneath the quick selection tool, uh, which will allow me to select kind of the background here. Get on this layer here. Uh, 
Uh, I can hold down shift to add to the selection. It's really not doing a particularly good job. Let me do this any faster another way. Let me use, instead of that, I'm going to use the quick selection tool. Yeah, it's not doing a good job. All right. Generally, to do this gray, I do it a different way. Um, let me just see here. We'll go back to this. The reason it's not doing a particularly good job is because there's a few artifacts, and unfortunately, this image is just not that high of a quality image. Does it make a difference if there's no background to it? It, uh, it, should, it should actually detect it really easily, um, and it's not. So I apologize for that. Actually, you know what? Since this one's really not turning out, we'll just leave it like this, and we won't do the gray version. I'll do the gray version on the next image uh, so we have a little bit more um, information. So uh, if I move forward in images, which one do I want to do? We'll do this one. Okay. I'm going to cut out this person who's running. Uh, and the reason that I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this is because of the hair, because I want to be able to show you how to do that part of it. Uh, so once again, I'll start the same way in that I'm going to use the crop tool. Uh, and I'm going to crop this down. <coughs> like that. I'll check the check mark. Yeah. The crop, the crop tool, it doesn't change the resolution. It just, the, the resolution will change as a result of the crop tool, if that makes sense. So the image is a fixed size. And when you crop the image down, um, the resolution stays the same, but you're losing out on, let's say, let's say the, the, the pixel dimensions of the image were 1,000 by 500. And when you crop it down, you might end up with only uh, 500 by 400, right? Because you cropped it down. So the image size has gone down, but the resolution hasn't actually changed. Uh, so you're limited by the original image size. Uh, that's why I said make sure to get the largest image you can. So in this context, uh, what I'm going to do is instead of oh, hold on a second, uh, instead of using the background eraser and trying to erase around this person, uh, instead I'm going to do a slightly different strategy, uh, and that is that I'm going to make a selection um, around this person. And Photoshop has some selection tools that work really well. Um, the first one is the magic wand selection, uh, and the idea behind the magic wand is it's going to try to select uh, a region based on similar colors and similar features. Uh, and so I click on, say, that background piece, and I really easily can get that as a selection. I can hold down Shift and select that background piece as well. right? If I try to select this region, eh, it's not as good. right? Similarly, you know, like if I'm in the tire, it's not as good. So it works best for large open regions of similar color. So something like this would work really nicely. Okay, if um, that doesn't work, there's another selection tool that can be used, uh, which is hidden under the magic wand. It's called the quick selection tool. Uh, it's relatively new in Photoshop, but it's pretty accurate, uh, and I like the results generally. Uh, and what you do is you click and drag uh, an area, and it will build a selection around that area. And so in this instance, I just lost out on this part of the hand. So let me zoom in, and luckily this is a much higher resolution image, uh, so I can spend a little bit more time with it. Um, if I lost this part of the hand, I can hold down the Alt key, and you can see that the, the cursor changes. See how it has a plus in the center of it right now? When I hold down the Alt key, it turns to a minus, uh, which means I can subtract from the selection. So let me try to subtract out her hand, and subtract out those pieces. Uh, I can, again, adjust the size of this selection. So if I wanted just a little bit more right in there, I could get it. Go back up in size, and that's just the bracket key. Uh, so I have that part selected. Let me work across the top here, right? I don't have to hold down shift because it's automatically adding to, because I have the little plus in the center. Uh, I lost part of the hat, so we'll go, we'll hold down alt and we'll subtract out that particular section. Uh, and Photoshop's pretty good at finding those edges for us, right? We're going to go down this side, so again, we'll just kind of drag and drag 
Oh, I lost part of the arm there. Um, so it's, I lost a lot of the arm there. Uh, so it's a little bit of work to get this to work, but it's doable. So let me go that way. Perfect. Let me make my brush a little bit smaller. I'm going to try to add in that section. Now, in here, right, it would be nice to add a little section there, which I did. Uh, I need to subtract that section. So when you have an internal cavity, right, you can very easily just continue with the selection. Get a little bit more, not too much. Take this off. Sometimes you have to add to be able to subtract. All right, so we've gotten down to there. We're going to continue working. Let me make my brush a little bit bigger with the bracket key. I'm working down there. Perfect. Uh, and it's trying very hard to intelligently grab certain regions. based on uh, what it thinks you're going to want. Okay, so there it grabbed too much of this shoe. So I'll hold down Alt and we'll subtract out some of that shoe. Okay, likewise it grabbed a little bit too much of the shoelace there. And grabbed a little too much down here. Perfect, so we got around. Now we're going to start our way back up this side. A little too much of the ankle and the shoe there. And again, gray shoe against the gray pavement, that's why it's having trouble. All right, so let's work our way up. Okay, Looks like we have a darn good cutout. Okay, So if I press Control-0, we can see the whole thing. Now, if I press Delete, Oh, sorry, this is my fault. It's still locked as a background layer. I have to right click and say layer from background. Now, if I were to press delete, we'd end up with a reasonably good cutout, but I've got a bunch of funniness going on here uh, with the hair. And I'd like to resolve that before I press delete uh, or create a, a mask. So what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna first go to select and then inverse uh, because I have the background selected and I want the person to be selected. So I go to select and then inverse and now it's just the person that's selected. And then I'm going to go to this Select tool, and I'm going to click on something called Refine Edge. And I will apologize in advance. I don't have this Refine Edge written up as a tutorial yet. This is what's going to take the place of Photoshop 1.13 now that they cut out the Extract filter. So I don't have this step by step. Uh, but if you run into trouble, uh, I'll, I'll be, uh, by all means, I'll help you walk through this uh, today. So this Refine Edge tool is new uh, to, to the Photoshop realm, and it does a great job on stuff like hair. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on um, for its use here. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit so that we can see the hair. right? And this is what we're going to work on. In the Refine Edge uh, dialog box here that pops up, we have a variety of view options. We can use what's called the Marching Ants, which show us the selection. Right? We can use what's called overlay mode, which is what I find most useful, uh, which highlights the selection or the, the, the non-selected items uh, in this kind of pinkish color. makes it really easy to see. Um, we can cut it out so that it's on black. We can cut it out so that it was on white, uh, which helps you to see the background. We can do black on white, which would show you what the figure would look like right now, um, which would be relatively ugly because of this big blob coming out of the side. Uh, you can see what it looks like on the layers, and you can reveal what, what the, the layer is behind. So I'm going to use overlay mode, because I think it's the most useful uh, in terms of seeing what's going on. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we have a couple different options. We can do a smart radius edge detection, or I'm just going to leave it at 0, 0.00. Under adjust edge here, I'm going to make some changes. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to bump up the smoothing to be at 3, and I'm going to bump up the feather to be at 0.3. Okay. Now, these aren't a scientific value. Obviously, there's a slider depending on what you're trying to do. Those are, values are going to change a little bit. I've found for dealing with hair and that sort of thing that this setting works pretty well. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and from here, what we're going to do is with my brush, I'm going to paint a region right over kind of where the hair would be. And when I do that, you see that the pink starts to trickle into the hair a little bit. Okay? And you can't see that much in the pink, but if I were to switch, say, to black on white, you can start to see that it's highlighting those strands of hair, which is exactly what I'm after. Okay? 
If we did this on a white background, you can see that it's shining through. One of the tricks with hair uh, is that the color of the background is always going to show through the hair, but it's going to get slightly changed. Uh, so if I were using this person running um, in a in a um, uh, you know in a collage or something where I was trying to make it show against the background that I created, I would want some of my background to show through the hair. Uh, and that's where we get this fuzziness. So something like this is a good thing, okay? And that's what we're after. So let me go ahead and go back to my overlay mode, and I'm going to continue painting all the way down in this section, right? I'm going to paint up there a little bit like that. I have a little section right there that needs to be adjusted. And so if I quickly jump over to my black on white, we can see that I'm doing a pretty good job. This section here is not something that I want, but the hair is looking very good, okay? So I can hold down the Alt key, uh, and I can actually subtract out this particular piece, because we know I don't want that, something like that. And we get a much better refined piece. Uh, I can also subtract off a little bit of hair there. Um, let me hold space, use the bracket key to make this a little bit smaller. Whoops. And let me hold down Alt, and I'm going to subtract off that piece there as well. Okay. I can also look up here. Let me go back to my overlay mode. Okay, it looks like I cut a little bit off right in here. So let me go ahead and use that refine edge. See if I can back add back in that little bit, um, and then we'll switch black and white. Okay, it's not bad, but I really want this to be solid because her head shouldn't be transparent. So I'll hold down Alt, and I'll subtract that piece out of the selection. Oh, come on. Uh, still having trouble with that. Let me go back um, to my overlay mode. It's just because it blends so well into the background. Yeah, that's not bad. We'll go with it. Okay. So let me press Control Zero. No, it won't let me. Control minus. No, it still won't let me. Okay. Let me see if there's any other areas. This is her arm. Uh, which is showing up as a little bit black. Let's see if we can fix that as well. Let me go into overlay mode, right? See if we can find that at all. Perfect. So that went away. Scroll down here. You can use this for against uh, the body, against clothing, anything like that. I'm going to work against the shoes for just a second. So let me go back to overlay mode. Uh, and we're going to try to work our way around these little shoelaces on the edge of the shoe there. And we'll switch back into black on white. So you can see I'm going back and forth. Hold on Alt, I don't really want that little piece there. That shoelace is going to be important, so let me come back up to overlay. Alright, good. Now the rest of this looks pretty good. Go back to my black on white. There's my shoelace showing through. Perfect. Okay, so we can go back to overlay. Once I'm done here, right, and I click OK, I just want to make sure there's nothing else that I should be dealing with. Uh, that arm and everything looks OK. Okay, so all of this looks pretty good. Once I'm done, I'll go ahead and say OK. Uh, and the result is not anything dramatic, it's just a selection. Okay, so I'm back to where I have those little marching ants like I had before. Okay. Now that I have those little marching ants, however, I can do one of two things. The first thing that I can do is I can go back up to select and I can say inverse and then I can press the delete key and have the background go away. Okay? That works. We've got some issues there. Okay? Uh, let me back up a step okay, where I'm here and let me go to select inverse so I'm back to having just her selected. Okay? And instead of deleting the background, I'm going to create a layer mask. And this is how I personally would do it, because it's a much more efficient way of doing it. And I can fix like that little piece in here that I'm unhappy with. Okay? So what I'll do is, with the selection made and the layer selected, I'll click on this Add Layer Mask button at the bottom. And it does essentially the same thing as pressing Delete on the background, except it gave me my original and my layer mask. Okay? And because it's a layer mask, I can work just like we did. Uh, just like we did. Sorry about that. Just like we did in the earlier um, layer masking, like when you did the HDR image. I can paint in black and white, 
to make things transparent. So I can go back up here to the paintbrush, making sure that I'm on my layer mask, and I'm going to paint with white. And I want my brush to be hard, which it is. Uh, and I can paint this part of the image back in so I don't lose that. So I have much finer control over some of the edges if I want to uh, fix those things. Notice, however, that the hair shows through quite nicely. Okay. So let me go ahead and press Control-0. Uh, and we can see that I've got my object isolated very nicely. I'm very happy with it. Okay. I'll go to File, Save for Web. And I'm going to save this one as a PNG24. I'll click Save. And we'll call this Woman Running. running. And I'll go ahead and click Save. Okay, So I've got that saved. Now I'd like to make this black and white. So I'll go up to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and we'll do a Channel Mixer. Okay, Monochrome. And once again, I'm going to go through my options. That definitely is horrible. Uh, we'll go through each of the options to find out which one looks best. Right? That one's not bad. Um, and so now I have a black and white, so I'll go to File, Save for Web. Click Save. And this one is black and white. Save. Perfect. And the last part was making that gray figure. And this actually is really easy because I have it created as a mask. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll create one new layer. And I have an option of either filling this layer with 75% uh, gray, or I could paint that layer with 75% gray. The key is that I have to adjust my um, foreground color, which is right here, to be 75% gray. And to do that, CMYK, K represents black. I can just type 75, and I'll get 75% gray in a neutral gray. And I'll say, OK. Now, I usually do this in 75% gray. Because it's a neutral gray, you could do it in black, but sometimes silhouettes are too strong if they're in black. If they're in gray, it's pretty easy to skew uh, the gray with some contrast or an adjustment layer on that particular piece to make it darker or make it lighter, uh, which is why I tend to pick gray. So I have it picked as gray. I can use the paintbrush. Um, we can make it bigger. And I could just paint this gray. Or I could use the paint bucket tool, which is underneath the gradient tool to just fill that whole layer in gray. Okay? It, it's giving me a scene because I painted this part first. Okay? So once this is 100% gray, all I have to do is copy this layer mask up onto this layer. And that's done by holding down the Alt key and dragging the layer mask up. And I end up with a nice gray silhouette. Okay? Because this was done as a layer mask, it's really, really easy to do this. Okay? So now that this is done, I'll go ahead and go to File, Save for Web once again. Click Save, and we'll call this gray. And I'll click Save. OK? So I have these this set done, and I'm going to go ahead and jump to the course website, and I'll show you how to post it. Now, I recognize that the Refine Edge was a little bit fast going through it. So what I'm going to do is, for those of you that want me to go through it again, I will go through the whole thing once more. And those of you that want to start, you can just kind of ignore me and start. But I want to get through posting it first. So I'm going to go to the new post. Uh, and I apologize, I have my administrator account, so I have a little few more options than you do uh, showing up here on the left side. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, this is a woman running with a hat. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and click on Add Media. And I'm going to upload each of those files. We'll start with the color version. I'll say open. And instead of setting it as a featured image, I'm actually going to click insert into post after each time I upload the image. So I've inserted that into the post. I'm going to click on add media, upload files, select files. And this time it'll be the black and white. Click Insert into Post. Perfect. Click Add Media again. Upload Files. 
This time it will be the gray. It's open. Okay, there's the gray version, and I'll insert that into the post. So I have all three of those images in my post. I'll come down to the very bottom, and now I'll go back and set a featured image. Uh, I'm going to pick the colored as the featured image, and then say set featured. I don't have to re-upload it because it's already been uploaded. There it is as my featured image. Now the key part here is on the right hand side of this, you guys are used to doing your categories. So we'll say that yes, this is uh, digital tools, it's exercise 109, there we go. Let me jump back up here, it's digital tools one. But if I keep scrolling down, you will see something called collage images, right? And this is how you're gonna categorize who this person is to help other people find this person and be able to use it. Uh, so this is running, which should be an action, right? Then I'll come down here. It's not an animal. It is, however, a person. There's a people. It's a female. And these are all different categories that people have used before. Uh, I'll call it a woman and a lady, not an old lady. Uh, and so that'll work. Um, we can say it's a person too. If you want some new category, you can create a new category if you want. Um, so all that's done. Now that I've done that, I'll go ahead and click publish. You're going to create a separate post for each of your five objects or people. Okay, so today you'll create five posts total. Okay, so once this is published, right, we have all three images. I have everything set up. We can view the uh, post just to make sure it showed up correctly. Which it did. Uh, and I have all three of those images uh, so that somebody else could use it. Okay? So, person's cut out, everything worked well. All right? Now, for those of you that wanted to see me do the refine edge again, I'm going to use a different... Oh, the one other thing I should have done, let me go back and edit the post, uh, is that I'm going to find the original image here, uh, and I'd like to be able to um, copy this link so that I can, I can say this is where I got the original image. So I'm going to look right here under share this photo, uh, and there should be the ability to pick the link. There it is. I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to jump back to my post here, and I will put at the bottom uh, image from original image from, and I'll go ahead and paste in that little link. I do want to make sure that it's a clickable link, so I'll select it, click on the little chain, and say add link, and so now there's a link to the original image. And when you're using Creative Commons licensed image, images, it's always a really good idea to put the links to the original images because that's how people grant you access to, to use the image and modify them and that sort of thing. So I have the image linked, I'll go ahead and click update, so that post is now done. Uh, so I'll move on, and I'm going to do the uh, this one with the woman sitting. I've got a bunch of hair to deal with, so it's another good example. This one's going to be particularly hard as well because there's stuff in the background uh, that I'm going to have to deal with this fence, uh, which will be problematic. Okay, so let me go ahead and, yeah. That's odd. Let me take a quick look so that you don't get stuck. Okay, so I'm going to work with this particular piece, uh, and I'm going to use a slightly different strategy for this one. Uh, again, we've got lots of options uh, in terms of how this stuff works out in, in Photoshop. Um, in this instance, I'm going to use something called a path to isolate my, uh, my person. Um, and so 
what I'm going to do is right click and say layer from background so that I have a workable layer. Then I'm going to click on the little tab that says paths. Uh, and paths in Photoshop um, are, are a little bit difficult to get used to. Um, you will get very used to paths when we get to the Illustrator section of the class, in which case when you come back to Photoshop, it be, oh, this is really easy. Uh, for right now, it's a little bit challenging, but I want to point it through uh, to you just so that you have the experience of it. The advantage of using a path over using a selection uh, is that the path is saved so that you can go back and reuse the selection over and over again. Um, and so what I'll do is with the paths highlighted here, I'll click on create a new path. Let's say path one, it's this little button down here. Uh, and then I'll use the pen tool, which is over here, to actually draw an outline of my person. Uh, and so I'll start, usually you have to zoom in a little bit. Right? I'll start right here because I'm gonna cut out this part of the bench. Uh, and so the way the path tool works is if you just click on points, you'll see it'll create straight line segments uh, between your points. So you can go through and, and, and actually highlight your object relatively easily by just clicking point to point to point. The path tool does, however, give us an option to instead of doing straight line segments, uh, I can click and hold and it will drag a little uh, tangent line such that I can actually start to create a curve. So if I was doing it, say here, um, I would want a curve to come down over the knee. Uh, and so that curves rather than being a straight line segment. It's very difficult to get used to how the pen tool works uh, until you practice with it. Um, and so some combination of straight line segments uh, plus some curving segments is probably how I would go about drawing this. So bear with me. I'm not going to be as accurate as I normally would be uh, because I don't want you to sit here and watch me trace this object too much. And so this takes a little bit of time, but it can save you some time uh, down the road. Again, sorry this takes time, but it unfortunately does. got her legs basically done. And the advantage of using something like this over using, uh, say, the, the selection, uh, the, the uh, magic selection tool, is that you can visually distinguish what certain pieces are and, and easily decide what should be cut out and what shouldn't be cut out, um, especially if the background's somewhat complicated. So we'll continue our way up. Okay, so now when I get to the hair, uh, I'm going to do some kind of basic outlining of hair, maybe a few of the tangles here, uh, but for the most part I'm just going to generalize because I'm going to come back with that refine edge to fix a lot of this. Almost there. Okay, when I get to the end of my, of my segment here, 
uh, you'll see that the cursor will change and I'll get a little zero next to it. When I do that, it will actually close the path. Uh, so now I've drawn all the way around my object. Uh, and remember, it has to be on paths here. If there was an internal void somewhere in this person, uh, I could cut that out as well. I could draw another path for that. Okay. Once I have this drawn, I can right click on the path and say make selection. Uh, and it gives me a couple options. It says, do you want to feather it at all? Uh, and how do you want to combine? So if I had multiple paths, I could combine them together by taking one selection and then subtracting from it uh, with another selection. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And it's now created the, sec the, the selection for me. I can switch back to my layers uh, and work directly on the layer itself. Okay. So once again, I want to refine the edge around the hair primarily. So let me press Control Plus to zoom in. Okay. Looks like she doesn't really like her book that much. Um, anyway, so we're going to go through and deal with her hair. So I'm going to once again go to Select and then Refine Edge. And because I was in the view mode uh, of Overlay last, it's going to show up as Overlay, which is nice and red. Uh, and I can see what I'm selecting. And I can work with the same settings. And so we'll do this at 3, and we'll do this one at 0.3. And uh, now I'm going to make my cursor a little bit larger, I hope. Press the bracket key to make it a little bit larger. And I'm going to highlight this edge of the hair. Highlight that little piece there. A little bit there. Across the top. Like that. In this section. Now she has a particularly challenging head of hair because there's a lot of little pieces. Um, and so we're going to do the best we can trying to refine this edge. And we'll take a look at it on white so we can kind of see what happens. Okay, So this is not the best, uh, partly because of the background. But let's see what it looks like on transparent. Okay, It's a little bit better. Uh, let's look black on white. Uh, we can kind of start to see that. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time working with some of these pieces. now. We notice in this, because of the background, see how I'm getting those cross hatches? That's from the fence behind, because it's picking up those just like it would be picking up her hair. So it's going to take a little bit of extra work for me to go through and refine out a few of those uh, vertical pieces. Like that. Something like that. And so we'll look up here. top is going to be probably the most challenging. So once again, it's about making these little selections. Then we can switch back to our overlay mode and kind of see what's going on. Right, so it's picking up those as kind of a solid object, which is not necessarily what we want. Let's go ahead and just remove some of that from there. Over here, we're going to run into the same problems with those vertical bars. So let's take a quick look at the black on white. Now, we're not seeing too much of them. Go ahead and get rid of those. Yeah, it's not too bad. Back to overlay mode. Look down here at the bottom. Okay, not too bad. Find that out a little bit. So in here, we're going to have to spend a little bit more time. We'll go back to overlay mode, and we'll see if we can paint in a little bit more in that section. Yeah, much better. Good. I'm getting some of those bars, so we'll hold down Alt and get rid of those bars. Excellent. Uh, and so now we can go back to that overlay mode, uh, and we can kind of go around the rest of our, our object. It's not bad in the rest of the places. We can check shoes down here. Uh, there's a little bit that probably should be refined. Um, I can work on that if I wanted to. Um, oh, there's a little piece that I missed, that little, that little triangle. Uh, I should probably deal with that as well. So now that I'm done, I'll go ahead and say OK. 
I'll press control zero so I can see the overall person. And once, once again, like I did last time, instead of deleting the background, I'm going to click the add layer mask button right here. And when I click on that add layer mask button, it will get rid of the background and keep just my person. Okay. I can also use the crop tool, which I haven't done yet, to crop so that it's just her. I'll go ahead and crop. Uh, and so I've got that little triangle still to fix, uh, but I can fix it uh, using um, just my mask. So I'll get onto my mask here. Let me zoom in. Um, and because I want to get rid of it, I'm going to paint with black. So let me go to my paintbrush. And I'll flip my foreground color to black, make my paintbrush smaller, and I can paint that part out to be clear. I can also refine things, like if this didn't quite turn out the way I wanted, right? I could shave that part off ever so slightly, like that. And I can generally look around uh, at my object and see if there's anything else. That little piece there is a little bit problematic. So we'll clean that up as well. Now the nice thing about doing this on the mask instead of doing it on, um, like using the eraser tool, is that if I don't like something, oh, I got rid of too much of it here, or whoops, I did too much, right? Because it's on a mask, uh, I can flip my colors and paint it back in and I can get my information back. So it's not a permanent deletion. Uh, and that's one of the big advantages of using the mask. Uh, instead of using an actual permanent deletion. So I can take a quick look here. Oh, see, this is me being a little bit quick when I did my selection. So I have to do a little bit of polish up at the end. Uh, let me just shave this part off there. there. Adjust her shoulder just a little bit there. All right. Press Control Zero. I can see her as a whole. Uh, I'll go ahead and go to File, Save for Web, and I'll go ahead and click Save. And this time it will be woman sitting. Uh, with book, and I'll click Save. Again, it's a PNG 24. This is what I wanted. Now I'm going to turn her to black and white. So I've got a layer, new adjustment layer, channel mixer, monochrome. And I'll pick whichever one of these looks the best. Yeah, that one looks pretty good. We go to File, Save for Web. Click Save, and this is going to be black and white. So I'm going to add underscore BW. Click save. And then the last one is doing that gray, uh, that gray layer, which is really easy because I have the mask. So let me create a new layer, and I'll fill it with the gray. And so let's make sure it is in fact 75% gray, which it is. And I'm going to use the paint bucket tool and just click on the layer. It fills all in, in gray. Now I'll come over to my mask, hold down the Alt key to copy it, and just drag it up to layer one and I end up with my nice gray cutout. And so I'll go ahead and go to File, Save for Web. Save. And we'll call this gray. Perfect. OK, so now that that's done, I'll go ahead and make another post, um, just for practice. So I'll come back to the Digital Tools site. I'm going to go to New Post. Wait, looks like I have to update this post first. woman sitting with book. And I will go to add media, upload files, That's the first one. Once it uploads, we'll insert that into the post. well.
into the post, and the last one I'll do is the gray one. So it takes a little bit of time to upload each of these. There's the gray one. No, I lost it. There it is. Insert in the post. So I have all three in my post. I'll make sure that this is digital tools. 109. Now I'll come down to my collage images. And this would be sitting. Looks like I don't have reading. So I'm going to add a new action. I'm going to call it reading. set my featured image as the color. Now if you wanted the black and white to be the featured image, that's fine too. It doesn't much matter to me. This is all done. I'll go ahead and create the link to the original. So, uh, original image, and I need to go back to wherever my, there it is. I'm going to go to the share link here, and I want just the link. So I'm going to copy just that link and go back here and I'll paste that in and make sure it is a link. That link. So now I have the original link. All that's done. I'll go ahead and click publish and now I've created my second post. Okay. So I'm going to turn you loose and let you, you're welcome to use any one of the strategies that we've outlined. Um, or any other strategy you'd like to, to cut these people out. The key is learning about mask and cutting things out and that sort of thing because that's that's going to be a skill that you'll you'll need down the road. Okay, so I'll let you go. Um, you if you finish these early, by all means, you can work on your assignment uh, 102s. If uh, you run out of time today to work on it, there will be more time next class to work on it. Uh, it's due a week from today, if I'm not mistaken, on the 24th. Um, so today's Wednesday next Wednesday it should be due. Okay? Um, I will also point out to you that we're rapidly moving through Photoshop. This is not a surprise. This is the way class works. Uh, next week we will actually start on InDesign, so it moves that fast, but we will come back and cover more Photoshop stuff down the road in the semester. So uh, it just has to do with how the scheduling works out. We need to get some layout stuff in uh, before we come back into Photoshop. Okay? So I'll turn you loose there. Sorry for the long-winded uh, explanation, but I think it's useful to go through it uh, several times. Okay.